President, I appear on behalf of the claimant, Mr. Wyatt, who sits at the back of the court with Mrs. Wyatt. Uh, we'll be going to, I hope, their representations, part of our submissions in due course. Yes. And I, I appear with Mr. Mr. Fagan, who sits behind me. Yes. Mr. Mould, Queen's Counsel, appears for the defendant. And Mr. Elvin, uh, furthest from me, um, and Mr. Wil Queen's Counsel, and Mr. Wilcox, appear for Natural England. I've got an apology at the outset. I, I am recovered, but I um, have um, a slightly croaky voice. So right. um, I see you've got three bottles of water to help. You. I have, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, if you if you feel at any stage you want just to pause, then of course we shall understand, mm. Mr. Jones. I'm very grateful. Um, before you get in, into it all, um, we'd like to thank the three of you for, or all of you, for the timetable you've agreed. Um, which seems to us suitable. Um, just to remind us all of what that says, um, the allocation of time today is that um, you, Mr. Jones, will have until um, one o'clock and then after the break until 3.30 today, followed by counsel, Mr. Mould, 3.30 to 4.30, and tomorrow morning, 10.30 to 11. And then followed, finally, by Mr. Elvin for Natural England. Tomorrow uh, morning, 11 to 12.30. And your reply, Mr. Jones, 12.30 to 1. Um, so we shall finish within the allotted day and a half. My Lord, yes. Um, of course, we should be asking questions, naturally, um, because we want to explore the issues properly. So you, you've allowed for that, I know, in your... In your as best we can. As best you can, yes. <laughs> so um, please do stick to, to that timetable. I'm grateful. Um, my Lords, I, I've just put, um, if given to my learning friends and also um, to your associate, and it may have come up, it's just an A4 sheet, it's nothing profound, setting the uh, sort of a, a headline route map of where I'm going. Um, yes. So um, hopefully that will also sort of help in a sort of internal discipline for myself in, um, in ensuring we meet the time limit. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, I ought to have said, incidentally, I'm sorry I didn't say, we're in this court and not um, <coughs> Court 75 because um, I was alerted this morning to a, an, a, a very irritating buzzing noise in that courtroom and I went into the courtroom and I instantly knew that we wouldn't be able to cope with that for any length of time so I made the decision that we should come to this court, and I hope that hasn't caused inconvenience. No, um, it's much better. You can have the buzzing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, my lord. All right. Um, I should just add that the first and third interested parties, and we don't need to go there, um, ha uh, made submissions, so that's the person seeking planning permission, yeah. and they're to be found, uh, just for your lordship's note, at um, core or court bundle, um, 25 tab slash 328 to 346. I'm not proposing to go to them. They were put before the, uh, the High Court. They were summary grounds of resistance that stood as detailed grounds. So far as the documents are concerned, I hope your um, Lordships have um, what we call the core bundle. Um, there's a supplementary bundle. And then it's authorities bundle, but I have them in two one, two, they're all tabbed. Yeah. And um, Mr. Alvin put in, but it's fair to say we would have asked for it to be put in in any event. Um, I believe at the end of last week, Natural England's current um, provisional um, guidance, both general and in respect of the Solent, yes. um, which I will come to in due course. Yes, well, I've kept those separate at the moment. I've not put them anywhere in the bundles. Um, I simply kept them together and kept them separate. I have just put them in a separate bundle um, with the covering um, letter that was sent to the chief execs and heads of planning. It's dated the 16th of March. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lord, I'll come to that, but most particularly in respect of um, obviously the first um, three grounds. Oh. Um, it's, Im it's important, obviously, when that we are looking at the grant of outline planning permission by the defendant, although obviously Natural England's advice, um, which was 
relied upon um, by the planning officer has come into play. Mm. And your, your Lordships will find, and again, I won't ask um, to turn it up, but just for your Lordship's reference, at the supplementary ba uh, bundle 396 to 404, it's for eight detached houses, and we'll come on to the nature of those houses in due course, associated development of Brook Avenue in Warsash. Um, but obviously this case um, has tapped into a matter of wider national um, importance, um, as uh, Natural England have made clear in their representations for ex expedition and also recognised by um, my Lord Lord Justice William Davies um, when granting per uh, permission, which your Lordships will have um, at court, uh, court bundle tab 792, where um, he, he recognised the uh, wider connotations and also referred to which we'll come and look at i'm afraid in some a little detail the post-hearing correspondence um from mr justice jay to the parties um and um and the, and the reactions to it i make it very clear it was no part in the hearing of um my own friend's defendant's case or natural well, natural england obviously position is is nuanced, they're looking after their um, guidance, that there was a discretion point, that if any of the things were wrong, it wouldn't make any difference anyway. And you'll see, um, obviously, the notes came in, obviously, at the request of the judge, um, um, and you'll see the different approaches that were taken. We focused very much on what we understood to be the position, was whether there was going to be an exercise of judicial discretion. But we'll come to that in due course. Well, Lords, there are four. There are four grounds of appeal, and uh, three obviously concentrate on the the approach the officer took to the advice given by Natural England. And I just highlight at the beginning because we've now had three had three witness statements, I think, from Natural England, to remember what was the position, basic public law, before the committee, and what what is the actual evidence. Um, um, uh, that um, supports the the, the note um, that that was relied on, um, <coughs> and um, the fourth point, and um, we do say it's unrelated in that in, in, to um, natural England guidance, but it's a straight we would say planning thirty eight six point, but should not be lost because it is is the fourth point, though. Um, Mr. Justice, um, Jay wasn't most gracious in um, saying that uh, the first and the four, and what was eight was my best two grounds compared to the others. Um, just because of the ordering uh, doesn't mean that um, it's not of itself. Uh, we, we will be submitting to your Lordships um, uh, an important point in, um, <coughs> and indeed the judge had some difficulty, and my learned friend Mr. Mould, um, so, um, I would agree with the judge, had some difficulty in, in, in describing how the officer approached it. So, we'll, But I'll come to that one last. The first ground, by way of overview, is the approach on um, national average occupancy rate yes. um, in the appropriate um, uh, assessment. And um, the judge's finding, which I know now is challenged by... Um, I don't need friends, but the judge's finding, which we do rely on, um, and we say it's plainly right, um, was that the national average occupancy rate was not the best sci scientific knowledge available at the time. And we'll come on, see, my clients as lay people had made the point very clearly. But nevertheless, having found that, <coughs> that the um, appropriate assessment was nonetheless lawful. In other words, met the required, which we will go on to say, high, very high, we make no um, uh, apologies about it, the law under the Habitats regulations is intended to be high and difficult to comply with. And we say that conclusion, I just make a preliminary and in introduction, three points. Mm. On that first ground, that conclusion was first inconsistent with the clear line domestic and European authority which says that appropriate assessment 
must be based on the best scientific evidence, number one. It, secondly, and it's related, did not pay um, proper regard, due regard, to the precautionary principle. And C um, was based on a misunderstanding of the role of the court in challenges of this nature. Um, and just for your Lordship's uh, reference, I'll come to it. But that particular point we've um, addressed in the skeleton argument to your Lordships, Ooh. para 24 to 32. Ground two um, challenges the learned judge's conclusion that the use of average figures mm. when calculating baseline nitrogen um, depositions from a site was sufficiently precautionary. Now, um, <clears throat> you'll see there's some discussion in his Lordship's judgment about that. Um, the average figure is, and we say, and was not capable of requiring the necessary um, degree of certainty. A reference there is 33 to 34, but I will take your Lordships when I come on to the legal outline in some detail through the Dutch, well, my Dutch pronunciation is not very good, so we call it Dutch nitrogen case, um, and to some additional passages that um, in both the Advocate General's opinion and the courts that um, deal with that issue. Ground three is the buffer. Yeah. And what we say is, frankly, it's absurd. You read it, and you see all these figures, and you think they're all calculated on some arithmetical basis. And that's, as we'll see, um, how you go through these nitrogen uh, budgets, and whether you're plus or minus depends on whether you. But then when we see, it's really stick a finger in the air and lick it. And we see that with the 20% buffer in the methodology for nitrate neutrality. And um, the judge accepted, and indeed he could do, no, well, you know, he could do something else, but of course it's common ground with natural England and in the evidence that the um, buffer is not based on an arithmetical calculation or other algorithm. Um, and we say he should have concluded that it wasn't sufficiently robust or precautionary. I mean, in truth, the buffer lacks any evidential or rational um, basis, and that's, again, your Lordship's reference, 35 to 39 in our skeleton. And then lastly is ground four, by way of introduction, is the separate issue on 38.6 of the um, uh, Planning um, Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. I know my Lords will be familiar with this. Um, it's the uh, statutory presumption um, in favour of development that accords with the development plan. Now, as we'll come on to see on that ground, the um, Supreme Court has made clear, or the House of Lords made clear, Tesco and Dundee, the interpretation of planning <coughs> policy, matter of law for the courts, um, its application obviously a matter of judgment. But in, in determining, and we'll see um, when we come to it, we do say um, one has got to understand whether, on the first stage, there has been a finding or an advice that there is compliance with the development plan or not before you go on to the second stage. And you can't merge the two. And um, that, is, um, um, uh, that is where this officer uh, has gone wrong. And we'd also say um, the judge was wrong to say, well, in other bits of the report, um, the um, Officer has written it very well. Um, well, I don't know how the report came about, but that doesn't, just because you've written a good section on, I know, conservation or something else, doesn't, um, doesn't overcome, I'm afraid, um, the fact that you've, um, on the key test, um, not correctly advised members. So, my lo Lords, we make two general points um, that this, this appeal makes, which are, we say of wider public um, general importance. First point um, is when a court is being asked to undertake a review of scientific soundness used in appropriate assessment, what is the role and what is the quality of evidence it expects? So a key role is going to be the role of this court. And what we will be saying is the application of Wensbury is different depending on the statutory requirements against which it is being tested. I mean, that's a short summary. Um, 
and um, of course um, it isn't enough simply because a witness statement is sworn by um, in this case um, uh, an officer of Natural England on behalf of their expert team um, for the court not to interrogate further um, and we'll come to the authorities on that in due course. Um, uh, uh, the second point is if the data that's being relied on in an appropriate assessment is itself uncertain, does the precautionary principle uh, uh, require the decision maker to proceed on the basis of a worst case scenario? Or what well, we've said reasonable is implied in that. But the um, point was argued at first instance uh, that the only judge appeared to decline uh, to reach a firm view. And it was said, I think, by those opposing me, that, um, well, the use of that phrase in, uh, my Lord uh, President will be familiar, uh, by Mr Justice Sullivan, as it then was, in an EIA case, uh, meant that it, it had no application to the precautionary principle. Um, well, come on to see why that's a flawed distinction. If anything, the requirements of the Habitats Directive are, are, are greater in terms of environmental protection. Uh, than, um, than environmental impact assessment, which is all about process and not about outcome. So um, that leads me on. That was the introduction, uh, in introduction by way of, uh, uh, as I've said out in my sheet, I'm going to turn now briefly to the, the, the factual background. And many of these points will mean that we can deal with the, um, the, um, the grounds, I hope, um, speedily. You'll find in... Um, um, the to, help is... you, to help you, Mr. Jones, um, you can, of course, assume that the court is familiar with the materials um, placed before it. I'm grateful, my lord, and if I, I, I will, if I'm going um, uh, labouring any point, please push. Well, push not at on. all. This is merely to help you. Um, yes, you can assume that we are on top of the material that's been put in front of the court. I'm very grateful. Your lordships will know that the the planning commission was for the construction of um, eight detached um, um, houses and of course it went before and I'll take this very shortly um, the planning committee twice um, and there are a number of um, points which are common ground uh, this was an application which engaged the requirement for an appropriate assessment so we're not in the sometimes the word taken from the EIA screening approach we're not in the stage of is this development um, likely to have significant effects on the integrity uh, uh, on a um, uh, protected area? It is accepted that it is. Um, what then came out following the resolution to grant um, was um, the question, therefore, of um, the advice by Natural England um, um, of, um, of, of, uh, that was updated on, 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 on nutrients and I won't uh, take your lordships to it because you're familiar but just for your notes it's a uh, case officer's report 1.117 supplementary bundle 21 220 to 221 so as a result of that the applicant amended to include a wetland pond which is included to, to mitigate any increases in nit nitrates from the site and to make the pro proposal, quote, nitrate new neutral. Now, for this purpose, and I just take your lordship very briefly through it, because this is the way in which it was approached at the planning committee in accordance with the advice on a, you know, a mechanistic um, mathematical calculation. So this was the nitrates budget calculation that your lordships will find at the supplementary bundle, tab 23, 273 to 274 you to and you find it at the end really yeah. um, is, is the bit that we can, we can, we can skip all the rest of the it's, 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 it's the end of the bundle yeah. right at uh, 273 it's, it's the end of the nitrate calculation you find on 274 it's the budget yeah. and very very briefly, you've got it there set out at the bottom of 274. Before any mitigation was taken into account, 
it was um, plus 7.01 kilograms per year. And then, in other words, without mitigation, it would add just over seven kilograms of nitrates. As a compared, we'll come onto this on the second round, to the lawful use of the site prior to any development. So what, what's being done, and the baseline is an assumption that if you, it's like a full, my lord will be familiar, it's like a fallback position, it's not you, it's like a fallback position that you could, if you don't get planning permission, you'd go off and use it for agriculture and pump X amount of nitrates. And therefore, that is then the sort of underlying comparison. Wetland would be 11.51 um, kilograms per year in mitigation, and then you do the calculation, it would be in credit to the tune of 4.5 kilograms per, um, per year. Oh. So there's just two points we'd like to highlight at this stage, my lord. First, when calculating the nitrate output from the proposal, it used the na national occupancy rate, 2.4, and you the Lordships find that at page 273, just across. That's point one. Point two, when calculating the nitrate output from the site, it was based on its existing lawful use. It used a number of average land use values. We'll come on to that in our um, second round. But that's 23.273. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to it. But it was average land... Um, so the council reviewed the evidence and then it produced its own appropriate assessment that your lordships will find at tab 22, mm -hmm. so just in front of that, and uh, 253 to two, um, 274, and um, probably go to 266. I'll just take, take your lordships very quickly through it. Um, number one. To, at, 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 at page 266 to 267, you'll see a large number of designated sites were screened into the need for an assessment. So um, they were screened in, these are protected sites, uh, because of the likely significant effect arising from, quote, um, a positive nitrogen output to the designated sites. So that was done at 266 to 267. Then 269, the council then concluded the proposal without mitigation would add 10.5, and this is at 269, um, kilograms or tonnes per year, which is 3.49 um, tonnes higher than the applicant. And that's because the council assigned different land use values to part of the existing site. So, um, as I say, when we come on to how you approach um, these land values, you can see obviously how uh, you twist the component and, and the outcome's different. Um, and that's explained um, by the officer, eight point, we don't need to turn it up, 8.37, which for your Lordship is in the supplementary bundle, tab 21, 237, and it's para 837 of the officer's report. Mm. Otherwise, the council accepted the figures by the um, appellant, including the use of 2.4, which was the national average occupancy rate. And the council also accepted that the wetland pond would provide up to 11.51 tonnes or kilograms per year in mitigation. And as a result, it would be in credit. And if you do um, the maths, it's 1.01 tonnes or kilogram per year in credit. Um, Natural England were consulted by the council they was, and, and responded twice. At the moment, we don't need to go to them, but for your lordships, note the actual consultation responses are at supplementary bundle uh, four. Yeah. Um, first one, 72 to 73, and then the second one is at tab five, 74 to 76. But in short, they concluded that providing the wetland uh, mitigation was adequately secured, which is a matter of the local authority, and that the council, and we, we'll come back to this, and the council was satisfied that the, that the figures used in the calculation were sufficiently precautionary, it was content. So in other words, of course, the council was the competent authority at the time, not Natural England, although it's a designated statutory body, and Natural England made it very clear, the Lordship will see in both those 
um, representations that um, it was. So that's the first point we made in observation that um, Natural England left it to the council to be satisfied that the land use figures were sufficiently precautionary. They didn't express a firm view on that question and the reference there is um, supplementary bundle 472 and um, I won't ask your lordships to look it up but I'll quote from it but you have it at, for Natural England said we quote provided that the competent authority is assured that the site areas used in the calculation are correct and the existing land uses are precautionary we are content um, it expressed no view at all that, <laughs> well let's go there um, page 72 page 72 it's the penultimate paragraph Mr. James paraphrased it. I would be grateful if, if we're going to look at it, the court could see what actually can actually advise. Yeah. Well, I've already. Well, I'll have a look. I've already marked it. Let me have a look. I'm, no, I don't want to be accused of something. And if I am, if I am wrong, I'll, I'll admit it. But it's not. I have it in quotation. So. Um, it's the paragraph, the penultimate paragraph on the page, I think. Um, let me just. Um, it's a nutrient budget. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But I have. It is. Um, need tab four in the supplementary bundle. Tab four, the supplementary bundle. Yeah. Page seventy-two. Yes, I have a ah, I have a page seventy-two, penultimate um, paragraph. The nutrient bundle has been calculated in line with Natural England's advice on achieving uh, nitrogen neutrality in the solent version five. And then this is the bit I was quoting from. Provided the competent authority is assured and satisfied that the site areas used in the calculations are correct and the existing land uses are appropriately um, precautionary. Um, precautionary, then Natural England raises no concern uh, with regard to the nutrition budget. Oh, it says we are content. I'm sorry. So I'm, ha I'm, well, I'm, I'm very happy with raises no concern with regards to the nutrient budget. But I don't know, I apologise by saying we're content where that came from, but um, at the moment I don't see that in substance there's any difference for the purpose of my submissions. But I'm grateful to my learned friend for um, drawing uh, attention to that because um, it was in quotation marks and it's obviously we're wrong. Um, it expressed, second point is we expressed no view on the correct occupancy rate to use. And thirdly, although the council make the point in skeleton argument um, at para 20... Sorry, just go back a step with yes. you. Um, on the occupancy rate, what do you say about this correspondence? Express no view on the correct occupancy rate to use. Right. <coughs> um, so you mean it doesn't say anything? Not no. That it, not that it, as it were, says that it expresses no view. Correct. So he doesn't deal with the point. Yeah. Just yeah, doesn't deal with the point. Yes. Okay. Yes. It, it, you mean it's silent? It's silent. Yeah. Yes. I'm. So um, the next point uh, just to make is um, for clarity, although the council make the point in their skeleton argument at para 25 to 6, and your lordships will find that, tab 3, um, page 46, that if, if they had asked at the time, is a point my learned friend made in oral submission, oh, they could have phoned up, I'm not sure if they could have phoned up, literally um, Miss Potts but um, if they had asked at the time about the justification for the use of 2.4 Natural England would have responded in the way that Miss Potts did in her witness statement I mean it's, 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 I, I think the case doesn't turn on that but no there's no evidence to support that and there was no contact between Natural England and the council of the nature of the time 
the, the, the Natural England case emerged effectively from the second witness statement onwards in these proceedings. Now, I can't challenge, um, I'm not challenging the veracity, we applied to cross-examine, but your lordship will, um, and that was refused, um, but your lordships will see that, that what we have are not contemporaneous workings or anything like that. But the fact, the, the, the fact of the matter is that there was no um, consultation with Natural England but, um, in, in the process of making the decision about the occupancy rate. It simply um, now um, members of the public made um, representations on the average occupancy rate. I'm not, obviously not going to take them, um, uh, your lordships, to all of them. But I think, in fairness to my claimer, my my clients who are here, here in the court of appeal, to see what they were saying, yes. um, particularly to see where we are, albeit provisionally, at the end of the day, with what Natural England is saying, subject to your lordship's position. So. Um, if we take Mr. Wyatt first, they had been, and his wife, Mrs. Wyatt, been suggesting using 3.4 right. as an occupancy. Can we, find, can we find the passage first? Yes, I'm just going um, to. Um, it's supplementary bundle, my lord. The first one is at um, tab 9 and starts at 93, but you go to. No, it's 94. Well, that starts by saying I would like to add these further comments. So, are we not first going to look at tab 8? Um, Mr. Wyatt's letter, email letter of the 7th of June. What's the, da what's the date, incidentally, of the document at tab 9? Tab 9, um, 15th of June. 15th of June, I'm told. Right. That, that was an email letter, was it? It was an email letter, and I think I'll be correct. Your Lordship will recall that um, it went back to committee. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, we just want to see what Mr. Wyatt was himself saying about yes. the occupancy rate. Yes. And the, the document of tab 8 is dated the 7th of June. Yes. Was that the, the first comment or representation or objection? I will need to take instructions on that. I rather well, doubt just, that it just, is the first. Okay. Just do that if you can quickly, otherwise we perhaps have a better look at it. Mr. White will check overnight, but for these purposes, he's not aware of there being an earlier submission from the 7th of June on, on this application. Right. So in, do we look at the 7th of June letter for any comment on occupancy rates? I, I wasn't taking your lordship um, right. um, to it. And then um, on, on tab 9 is the document of the 15th of June, you tell us. Yes. And you want to take us to a passage that deals with occupancy rates in that? I do, my lord, yes. Yep. So, um, it's where he, he um, it's a paragraph, is it, is it I now wish to address the new issues yep. directly. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the following paragraph he refers to the opinion that I, figure I, of 2.4 people per household as a yeah, starting point. Yeah, and um, he points out, and we'll come to this in due course um, later on in, in ground two, that Fairham Council has all used this discretion said, where they used a lower um, uh, rate occupancy 
for um, 16 age-related apartments. <laughs> um, they were predominantly one and, uh, 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 bedroom and only four were two bedrooms. And they use what they term uh, an overall cautious average occupancy of two. And he said that's in line with the 2011 census. And um, the applicant, so this turning to this application, has ticked the box in number for eight of four plus bedrooms, presuming this means five or more. I'd expect the planning officer to be consistent. Um, the ONS 2011 census figures gives an average occupancy rate of 3.4 per household for houses of the size more appropriate figure. So he was uh, drawing attention to the um, uh, uh, the um, approach mm. on, in that respect, on size of size of house, mm -hmm. uh, rather than using the one size fits all national, regardless of geography or house size. You have the national, a bit like whatever it is, the 1.9 children that we all have, or 2.1, whatever it is. It was the national um, average. So um, he he he. Uh, raised that point and um, his his wife if we turn over to oh yes and there's um, well he mentions further opinion um, which deals with a number of things which is then attached but tab uh, 10 and I will get instructions but this is from Mrs. White I'm assuming at the same day um, as, as Mr. Wyatt you'll see the nitrogen budget occupancy. So, so was that also the 15th of June, you're saying? I think so, but I'll just get confirmatory because there isn't a date on it. Oh, that's mm -hmm. where I'm asking. It's in the index, my lord. It is the 15th of right. June. Sorry, I, my apologies. It, those in front, there, they are, it's in the index. That's, mis that's Mrs. Wyatt. This is Mrs. Mrs. Wyatt. Mm -hmm. And um, there, um, could I take your lordships to... 110, and it's the heading, um, the nitrogen budget occupancy. And so, um, <clears throat> what she says there, uh, actually, could I just let your lordships, uh, oh. if you haven't re read it, rather than me reading it out? Well, she, um, she also puts forward the figure of 3.4, doesn't she? Yes, I mean, she refers also to um, advice that will come come to and highlights that authorities may choose to adopt the scope <coughs> tailored to the area or scheme. Um, she points out this is not an average development. Um, and um, she points out she asked the ONS for advice on data sets to show the occupancy in relation to the size of the property. They suggest a report based on the 2011 census called tenure by household size by number of bedrooms in England and Wales. And that actually she said, uh, allows you to calculate the average household size with five or more. That's 3.4. So she gives a little bit more flesh on where she's gone to. She's gone to the ONS. And um, she also makes the point of, um, and we'll come on to see with the danger of um, jumping into averages and then jumping into bespoke. Um, um, she makes the same point. And then just... Um, the last paragraph at the top of 111, and then I'll move on. Thank you. <clears throat> right. So, um, your lordship will find, um, your lordship will find, I know you read it, it's, it's 8.32 of the supplementary bundle. Um, I'm not going to at this stage, the officer's report, which is, um, Tab 21, 234 to 238, 8328 to 851. Right, just, just pause for a second. Do you, you're saying you don't want us to look at this? or that Not at this stage. Um, I'm going to comment on it, but if you feel more comfortable having it. Well, we, we have read the report, but just give us the reference again. If you the know. reference is para 8.32 to 8.51. Yeah. And I'll just summarise it. But in accordance with the appropriate assessment undertaken by the council, the officer advised that with mitigation there would be no adverse impact on the integrity of any designated site. And then on, he deals with the use of average occupancy rate. And he addressed this um, at 8.34 and 8.42,
which is at 236 and it may be worth just going to that when we come back to the arguments about which effectively discretion arguments that uh, uh, the result uh, 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 would have been the same even if you reject a household figure and what we say is the judge the judge was right in his initial uh, which he records in his judgment view that um, on the nutrient balance you were either in or you were out and um, that was the approach that the um, council were taking and if you go to the officer's report on average occupancy rate mm. just interesting to see what he was advising members so at the end of the day the members are will be the representing the competent authority as the approach they took mm. rather than what maybe now being advanced for your lordship right so which paragraph do you want us to look at in the report so um it's really eight three. Um, if, if your lordship, the heading uh, is eight. The heading is, is as it were, orphaned at the foot of page two three five. Yes. Um, but it's eight three eight to eight four two, isn't it? Yes, it's the heading at the bottom, which is two three five. You turn over. Yeah. Eight three eight, and we'll come on. It's a start. The starting point is two point four. However, competent may choose others where they are satisfied. There's sufficient evidence to support this this approach. Concern has been raised by third parties over the use of average rates for development of eight houses. <coughs> Some have expressed the view higher rate ought to be applied. They're likely to be larger than average dwellings. Though it should be noted the applications outline form the scale and their reserve matters. I'm not quite sure how that would um, have any impact whatsoever. Um, uh, it's not going to turn um, a five bedroom, four bedroom house into a one bedroom. Third parties have noted the council used bespoke calculations when determining the recent planning application for sheltered housing. That's where they lowered it. It's acknowledged that some housing will have more than average numbers of occupants, so of course that some will have less. The figure of 2.4 is an average base, well evidence ONS, which is national, shown to be consistent over the past 10 years, which means average, uh, average occupancy av on whatever number of bedrooms over any region of the country. Mm. As stated just, above, the natural... pausing for a second. Um, you, Picking up the point that you mentioned on person just now, um, we perhaps need to look at the application for planning permission. But what was the application as described at the top of the report on page 220? I know we've got the application document. But um, was it, as it were, merely eight detached houses? Or was it eight, eight detached houses of four to five bedrooms? I mean, it, it, it may be that you're right, you see, to say that it would have made no difference, that there was reserved matter still to come, but how, how do we approach this um, question? On the basis of the application materials. Yeah. This was an outline application. Um, the, the, the application form at tab 20, I think, is on page 215. Two. And the, if you go to 217 in part 9 of the form, yes. residential units, number of bedrooms, 4 plus 8. And you're saying, are you, that the application must therefore be understood as being definitively for um, eight dwellings of four bedrooms and above each of them? Yes. That's right, is it? Yes. That, and that, is that common ground? Has been up until now. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear yes. about that. My Lord. So, so the figure which um, Mr or Mrs Wyatt gives of the ONS average occupants rate for 3.4 persons. Mm. Is that for four bedroom houses or five bedroom houses or four and above? Yeah. <coughs> I know the answer, but I want to make sure. You're getting instructions. I know, well, it's, it's asking specifically as to what she had. About. So I well, it's asking what the ONS... The instructions are coming. Actually. They're on their way. Yeah, to I, I think I know. There we go. 
That's that's for five, which we interpreted four plus. Yeah. So three point four yeah. is for five. Yeah. And we must not be drawn into pro rata reduction um, arithmetic. Um, but that that would give some sense to the to the, to the observation made in paragraph eight three nine, wouldn't it? Um. Although the parenthesis, although it should be noted that the application is in outline form, well, that's made and layout of the development of the reserve. I know, but that's 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 not going to alter whether they're um, the, the the number of bedrooms. Well, no. The point being contemplated by my lord, I think, is that um, if if three point four is an average for five, then the average for four might be less. And if you've got an application for four, um, there might be some adjustment at reserve matter mm -hmm. stage within the scope of that on the outline application. Well, that's all. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to see in any event that then Dr. Neil um, also, which is the other issue, actually looked mm. at what the position was for the actual area. Mm. It's a little smaller. Yeah. Um, then, then, All right. Um, well, we can we can come back. To we that. can come to it, but um, um, but um, well, let's, yeah. let's, let's distract. Don't let's distract yeah. you from what in, you're in saying. In any event, no calculations would run no. on an alternative scenario. Oh, no. Um, no. Well, we don't, we don't we don't want to get into calculations but, ourselves. But, but but you carry on with your submissions. That this was this was simply to clarify what yeah. was said at eight thirty nine. But can I just draw your Lordship's attention? What I say is the more relevant, with due respect, the more relevant point mm. is the officer talking about um, uh, a contemplating. He says, when he deals with the concerns, you see at 839, he says, some have expressed to you the higher occupancy rate, since some are likely to be larger, and they've spoken about the third party's use of an average occupancy. And then it's go, 8.40 is acknowledged that some houses will have more than the average, of course, some will have less. Um, and and what's been shown to be consistent. And um, in the case of sheltered homes, which is owned and managed by the council, for example, it's previously considered appropriate to use a reduced rate. Um, now, um, we'll come on to we'll come on to see. Whilst the notion that number one, the averages can somehow in the future work themselves out, is completely contrary to the um, in our submission the clear case law. Of the uh, European Court of Justice and uh, the requirements for the Habitats Directive as of future speculation on averages. Um, but secondly, also, which we'll see, which we argue, but also is acknowledged, albeit in the provisional advice given now by Natural England, is that you can't opt in and opt out. What you can't do, as Fairham, as which they are doing, is use national averages for some things. And then, opt for um, example, a sheltered housing. Uh, they then use a, they depart from it and give a bespoke. And you'll see, we'll come to that in due course with Natural England's um, advice because the whole thing falls apart. Well, the whole thing is say, fundamentally intellectually flawed. Um, so um, then it says a point one in all instances is the case that England. Natural England's methodology is sufficiently precautionary. It assumes that every occupant of every new dwelling um, is a new resident, and then it refers to the 20% buffer. So taking into account there's any um, justification for allowing anything other than 2.4. So does the advice actually say that it assumes that every occupant um, no. is a new resident? No. I mean, I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. It's not in there. looking in the wrong place. No, it comes in the... The first we saw it, it is in the evidence produced by Natural England, which Bates. is also, I would say, carefully drafted. Um, um, I'm sure, sure it's good. Carefully drafted and, and, and talks about, um, and we'll come on to see, um, that somehow there are inbuilt, very uh, unspecified precautionary elements include... For example, we're told in the, wit in, in the um, witness statement an assumption that everyone would be an inward mi uh, migrator. We have no evidence as, as to um, you know, how, how you know, directly or contemporaneously how that fell in. 
I mean, this is we one didn't of the find points, it in the this guidance. This one of the points which weighed with the judge, but you're you're telling us it's not in the whatever Miss Potts or Natural England may have thought. It's not actually in the advice given. No, we don't believe so. We 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 don't believe so. We'll come to I'll come to the advice. Yeah. In, okay. in, 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 Thank you very much. In a moment. Moment. I mean. I mean, this is the thing that I do emphasise, and it's often said against claimants, but I hear we're saying, we have to look at what the decision was, what the decision maker was taking, and what was before the decision maker at the time. And we've had substantial supplementary um, evidence from Natural England um, put in, um, which doesn't appear in any of the guidance notes, uh, that was, which is the guidance note at the, at the time, that um, uh, decisions were um, uh, to be taken into account. You see, at some point, we, we are going to need, I think, as you've already indicated, um, to consider what our approach should be to the evidence that has been put before the court um, as a matter of principle. Mm. Um, there's evidence on both sides, um, as it were, after the event. Um, question, at what stage do we have to look at um, as the appellate court don't answer this now but I'm just putting it yeah. there for you to consider um, how do we approach the evidence put before the court do we take it into account and if so how do we take it into account these are important questions I think that we need to grapple with so you will come to that I'm quite sure in your submission I will, my lord, no yeah. um, and it's not just the role of the appellate court to Court at first instance as well. Well, yes, but I mean, we're, here we are as the as the appellate court. But of course, we we subsume in our question the whole issue of um, what the first instance court um, must do in a claim for judicial review. My lord, that's right. I'll come on to address your lordships, but um, I'll address your lordship on the overarching obligation of the courts in any event. Right. Well, we'll, um, come, we'll come to that. Don't let's attempt it now. But you're going to come on to it. Um. And then, and then um, following that, um, obviously, there was a split 7-2 decision, and it was um, um, granted. In fact, actually, my next thing was just, and I'll deal with it very lightly, is um, um, there's, um, I think, a footnote objection to Dr. Neil's evidence from Mr. Elvin's skeleton argument. Can I just say, say something without getting into We applied at each stage for a court's. Um, application to admit um, evidence, which was not done by Natural England, um, but it was. All, um, but the, the the key point is the. Um, we, so we applied it. Um, well, we only put um, 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 we only put one witness statement in from Dr. James O'Neill, which you've got and will come to. Uh, supplementary bundle, tab fourteen one three eight to one five three. Miss Potts has filed three witness statements. Um, um, none applying for leave to be filed, as it happened. Um, at tab 18, 199 to 210 for the supplementary. Mm. Tab 16, your Lordship's got yeah, them. We've, one, see, we've seen them, yes. Um, and, and, and read them. Mm. And, and you have leave to file from Mrs Justice Lang. Yeah, I'll come to, to Dr O'Neill. Yeah, mm. you did. So, for the, so just before my learned friend mm. misunderstands the position, the first witness statement was a very basic one supporting mm. the summary grounds. The second one was an explanatory one to explain how the advice came about. Mm. The third was a response to Dr. O'Neill mm. with the leave of the court. Yes, yes. that's what I so, thought was the yeah. case. The second one had no leave, and no application was made for it. And and um, I'm not misunderstanding the position. I understand the rules quite properly. And anyway, we are where we are. And Mrs. Justice La Lang, and for your Lordship's note, Yes, we um, I mean, we granted did find, leave. We did find her order, I think, granting yes. leave. It's at 131 and 133. I'm not going to say anything more about it, but Mr. Elvin raises it in um, a procedural matter in his footnote. I'm, if he had problems with Mrs. Justice Lang's order, he should have challenged it at the appropriate time. I've got nothing else to. But I, I can't see why he would have had any problem with that. Well, he, he's raising an issue about it now the admissibility of the evidence. No, I was only repeating by reference to the skeleton I'd put in at first instance. I'm not taking the point back. So Alright, well let, let's, get, let's get on. Let's get on. What? Well, I'm sorry, I can only go off the skeleton argument and what's said in the skeleton argument. 
yeah, let's make it it's, it's maintained but anyway we 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 have the order so can we actually go then to the, the advice note as um this is my next um topic my lords and um so we've covered your section of five elements of structure we're now on the third we're on number three yeah um, so, um, I don't know if we're allowed to know this, it's not in evidence, but as a matter of interest, uh, is there an ONS figure for four bedroom houses? Yes. I think there is. Um, get it. Yeah, I think there will be. Um, I'll, I'll um, take instructions. I'll just deal with Dr. O'Neill's. Yes. Oh, is it? Oh, thanks very yeah. much. Yeah. I'll come on to Dr. O'Neill on because, because he deals with it and he also deals with the locality as well. Yes. So, um, right. so, um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at the advice. Right? Yes, please. <clears throat> Um, and your Lord should find that tab one. Uh, the, um, can I just um, draw attention to an, an, a, 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 a number of uh, matters? <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll remind, remind ourselves of the context of the habitats regulations as, as well. But um, basically, the, if your Lordship sees the background of 2018, um, a review took place of the condition of the designated water environment in the Solent area. And the best scientific um, evidence um, at the uh, available showed um, pollution. Where are uh, you reading from? If you take, what, if you want to start at 1.1. Yeah. So the Solent region is one of the most important for wildlife yes. in the United Kingdom. Um, it refers to its international re um, um, importance, um, and then it, 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 it um, then addresses um, the high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus input in this water. I, with sound evidence, they're causing I wish to this wrong, eutrophication uh, of those designated areas, and it's coming mostly from agricultural sources, which is now being used as the fallback position or from wa um, waste water from existing houses and other development. The resulting deaths ma and mats of green algae and other effects in marine ecology from excessive presence of nutrients are impacting on the solent's protected impacts and species. There's uncertainty at 1.2 as to whether it will further, and it, we'll come and see that they're in unfavorable status, further deteriorate designated sites. So a point we will all be making when one looks at it and it's picked up in the case law. We're dealing here, when you're looking at whether something is sufficiently precautionary, a relevant fact, obviously, is whether the site is already failing or whether it's in favorable status. If it's in a failing status, um, even neutrality just preserves that. But anything that on the error side of caution is contributing to that failing status. Then the work was undertaken, it's ongoing, he said. Till it's complete, the uncertainty remains. The potential for pure, further development across solar to ex exacerbate these impacts creates a risk to their potential future conservation status. And what is proposed is this concept of nitrogen neutrality. And if you look at the second line, we just it's 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 said to be a means of ensuring. I'm gonna highlight that word. Development does not add to existing nitrogen burn, and this provides certainty, again, that the whole of the scheme is deliverable in, in, in line with the requirements of the, the Habitats Directive. So, insofar as nitrogen neutrality is concerned, um, it, it isn't seeking to improve the situation or turn unfavorable favorable. It's to allow further development, or would allow, as long as it um, remains neutral. But that is on the basis of ensuring and certainty that anything further that is allowed against a background of already failing 
um, to achieve um, the protection um, of something that is acknowledged to be one of the most important um, areas of um, uh, wildlife in the United Kingdom and has international designation. So, um, can I just take... Um, just as a matter of interest, um, we haven't yet identified particularly the species or, or main species, if you like, for which these areas are so important. Is that something you want to do? I can can, can go. Uh, we will we'll, um, go to the main the main issue, and it was an issue that Ferrum itself got confused between between SAA, SAC and SPA. Mm. Is that this is about protecting fundamentally the habitats mm. on which these species? Um, yes, uh, yes, uh, but uh, otherwise, if we don't, as it were, recall what the species are, yes, the whole exercise to, yes. takes place in a in a kind of yeah. vacuum. Yes. Um, I'll take you to the various species. You know, the, the, the onlooker might say, well, what is this all about? And um, we, we might just pay attention to that. Yes, I'll take your lordship's to course to the species of birds. And, Thank you, yes. And I did. Um, can I just... 2.2 um, is just a reference to what I uh, 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 said at the outset, that in 2018, um, that's 2.2 in 2013. Um, the um, the um, uh, exercise of review was being carried out. And, um, and then what that identified, and we're looking at a little bit more detail in the officer's report as well, that some of the interest features of the designated sites, these are interest features which are highlighted in the conservation center, such as intertidal mudflat habitats, wildlife, are widely in unfavorable condition due to the existing levels of nutrients, and they are at risk of additional nutrient inputs. Um, then 2.5, uh, I, I skip out about the um, Ramsar, but they're also um, Ramsar sites. There, um, there's uncertainty about the impact of new development um, on designated sites needs to be recognized for development. These impl implications and other matters capable of having significant effects um, and they must be addressed in accordance with the regulations. So, um, the best, um, so if one looks at um, taking your lordship to Paris 2.3, your Lordship, again, Lordships have, and I want to read up section um, three. Um, section three. Section three, page um, page six, uh, six to seven. Yes. Um, sets out the environmental context of the key areas that we're interested: Salem Marine, SPA, Portsmouth Harbour, Chichester, and. Um, And that your lordship sees um, the, the assessment to be failing, and they give examples: sea grasses, as well as biomass. Um, they, they are considered to be part, in part, due to elevated nutrients. Um, and then there's um, mention of salt marsh. And then, in terms of Solent and Southampton water, uh, the condition assessment hadn't been taken. But a number of bird features are declining, and there's been a um, there's a wet, wetland bird survey alert, and they've compared it with national and regional trends, and um, and they they come to the conclusion it's site specific rather than um, wider national. Um, at the moment, they're not quite sure. Um, and then then there's. Um, the um, uh, addresses the triple SIs um, and the up, um, updating um, um, that took place there. Can I then just take your lordship to, and I know your lordship has read this document, um, so I won't take, um, but Annex 2, um, uh, which is at 40, 41, yeah. um, designated site reviews. And, um, well, my lord, I won't re um, read, it, read it out, 
but again um, it's the finding of um, solent marine SA, SACs and SPEs they're failing um, these failures are likely in part from nutrients currently the site assessment doesn't include the salt marks features yet to be assessed but preliminary um, assessment shows that there's a loss of salt marsh um, it's not known that elevated nutrients can contribute to salt marsh so um, there's um, at least um, a prospect that that's impacting on salt marsh mm. um, and then um, a full condition survey yet to be undertaken um, um, however Chichester Harbour um, uh, that was assessed its SPA as, as well as well as the triple SI birds it showed that um, for example that uh, the shell shell duck population the triple SI is showing a 71 percent decline as an example of one of them um, in long term and there appears to be tracking that, of the region but not a British trend um, and um, and it also found uh, that the foraging ability of shell duck can be affected by algae mats. So it's not just um, being there, things that they eat, but foraging around. Well, the algal mat forms a, a mat on the surface of, yes, the, that's right. of, the, gra of, of the ground, um, which prevents the bird from getting at, the, yes. at, at, at its um, prey. Yes. Uh, um, they all live at the bottom. Because it can't penetrate that. Yeah, they live at the bottom. I think that's what happens. Yes. Um, and then the wintering bird assemblage in the general Chichester Harbour is an unfavourable no, no change condition. So that's. Um, yeah, I mean, and I then others, along the species, other species are also ma ma mentioned. Yes, A23. Uh, um, the sandwich turn and the little turn. Common turns, haven't you? Yes, and little turns. Turn. Yeah. Um, the threats. SPA is not being fully condition assessed. But the Harbour Review of Chichester 2020 looked not only at breeding numbers of three turn species, but also productivity. How many chicks survived? The turns in Chichester Harbour are also a feature that are considered to be overall unfavourable declining. So that's, that's as opposed to unfavourable no change. Is that unfavourable? Um, and the relationship of the turn breeding and foraging to water quality impacts in the sound is not currently known, although it's thought to be the primary reason for declining number of core productivity in Chichester Harbour. Um, and then, what, then one has um, um, uh, Solent and Isle of Wight. I'm not going to um, uh, read that. Um, So, um, what is the point that we're getting from this exercise? Right. So the, 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 the point of the exercise is that the starting point here is, an, is not favourable. It's unfavourable or unfavourable declining. I'm putting it in simple terms. I mean, one can go through the whole of, of the report. That is the background against which the requirements of law have to be applied. So there is, and you'll see it in the... Um, court's judgment and partially reflected in different wording in now the provisional um, natural England guidance. But basically, if you're in unfavourable conditions, it's pretty unlikely you're going to get consent for more development. And we look at the case law that says that the European Court of Justice, and we look at the wording slightly differently um, used um, in, the, in the provisional, be it provisional, that's now been issued by natural England. And is, your uh, point, is your point really that the background is that things are already bad and all that a nitrogen budget does is stop them getting worse? Well, I... It doesn't that, make that, them better. That, 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 that was a point. But that's not our main, um, um, main, main point that I'm making for your lordship. Your lordship is, is right in respect of that. No, our point is when you're looking at what is sufficiently precautionary and what the role of the court is in order to secure um, uh, requirements, there is, there is a difference which the court recognises, even though it's a high level in any event. So I'm not saying just because a uh, conservation area is in favourable status, you don't need the high degree of certainty. But, but it is relevant that the starting point that you're starting with is a, um, effectively a breach position.
because as our uh, as your lordships will be familiar I'll take the requirements of the habitats uh, regulation and the directive is not just we preserve the status quo we need to ensure that those things that are unfavorable become favorable and those things which are unfavorable don't become any worse but become favorable i probably repeated myself on the last one but that so the 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 position therefore is when one's looking at oh well um uh, this is the best practical solution we can do. Um, that isn't the result. The law is actually saying, and this is a different shift. Uh, I'm touching on what my, my Lord President uh, asked me. This is a shift from what planners are used to under Section 38.6, under uh, Section 70, where all material considerations are subject to simple weighting considerations and you can make your decision. This is something where, as, as I'll, we'll go on to show, the courts have an active supervisory um, uh, uh, role, and that the threshold for the most endangered species, so you only come into the uh, Habitats Directive if you're um, under threat, um, and those particularly in unfavorable species, uh, species, there is, the computer may have to say no, and, and, and that isn't left um, uh, uh, to be left to a wide um, a planning discretion. That judgment has to be done within the legal parameters of the habitats regulation. That doesn't change Wensbury, but it's Wensbury applied. Wensbury doesn't get applied in a vacuum. It has to be applied against the statutory provisions. And in this aspect, we'll come on to see that they're different. But as part of that factual, background because the courts have drawn attention to it quite rightly the fact that we are in fact looking at protected areas where there is of this uncertainty where the indications are of the key features uh, the key features are unf in unfavorable status either continuingly uh, leading to species which are um, uh, in unfavorable declining um, that impacts also on the, the approach this court takes and which the competent authority takes. And I'll hopefully make that good when we come to it. But this is just the reason I'm taking your lordships to it, is this just to make the factual background. I'm not going to take your lordships any more into it. Your lordships, in case you've read the papers, you'll see that is um, the, um, the context of um, um, and indeed, um, at paragraphs 1.1, we just looked at 1.2. Um, oh, well, we go to ta uh, sub supplementary bundle at tab um, four. Um, we have from Rachel Jones of Natural England, um, 18th of August 2020. Uh, um, she's responding to um, Richard Wright of the, uh, of the authority. And she said, um, recognizes, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, Solent recreation and mitigation strategy, um, since under that, since the application will result in net increase in rate, impacts to the coastal special protection may result from increased recreation pressure. Parameters measured to increase potential in strategic subject. To, um, oh, sorry, de deterioration of water. Sorry, what is the point here? Um, <coughs> <coughs> It's just, um, and I don't need to read it actually, it's deterioration of water environment. It's, a, it's the second paragraph, the nutrient budget. The paragraph we looked at earlier. Yeah, and then could I take you to tab one, page four, my lord? Yeah. And um, I, well, I've already taken your lordships to it, but your lordship will see at 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2, um, the recognition of uncertainty um, 
whether new housing would further deteriorate our sites, and I've taken your lordship to do it. Is it your submission, Mr Jones, that given this background, this local planning authority cannot give planning permission for any new housing development? I no, it's not my submission, but that may be the result. And it was an issue that, um, in oral submission, Mr Justice Jay raised a concern. What, what is the impact for housing development? I said, well, frankly, my lord, that's not your lordship's concern. If we are, it is a matter for Parliament. If Parliament post-Brexit wants to depart and be honest about the position, um, it, it, needs, it, it needs to make an amendment to the law. So my submission, answer to my Lord Justice Singh, is that may be the consequence. And in fact, uh, there are sites, I mean, recently in planning, this week in Ashford, has been given planning permission exceptionally because in Kent, because there's a similar issue in Stodmarsh, which we referred to in, our, um, in the High Court, similar thing to here, Ashford doesn't impact on the nitrate neutrality. So a planning decision has been made to allow development that may not otherwise have been granted because it doesn't impact on this. So the, the question is, there may not be a way, I mean, this is, there may not be a way, my Lord, in order for a local planning authority to find a solution unless the evidence comes to the very, very high threshold uh, to satisfy. That is what the law requires. And so my submission is, it's important that we, do, we are not giving lip service and just re <clears throat> recanting um, quotations from judgments and then leaving everything uh, to what is, frankly, a cut and paste exercise that cannot on any scientific basis um, be said to be the best scientific evidence. So it may have the consequence, my lord, I'm not saying that it is illegal, it follows legally, it would depend on whether the evidential thresholds are met. But this court has a role in ensuring that those evidential thresholds are met, and they are very high. They are very high. Make no bones about it, my lord. Um, the, this is tough, and it may create all sorts of other problems. I, 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 I mean, but those are not relevant. If, if, um, uh, they are. There is, of course, under the Habitats Directive, IROPI, uh, uh, which is carried through through the regulations. You then go into the exceptions procedure, where you accept you're going to have harm the integrity of the um, habitat, but you say there are no alternatives. There's overriding public importance for the development to go ahead. We're not in that sphere. So the legislation does provide the decision maker with, it's in the, in the um, directive, it's Article 6, four, I think it's Article 6, uh, Regulation 64. But you, you go into that. That is not this case, because what's being said here is there's going to be no harm. We can all uh, proceed merrily, kind of business as usual, with our nitrate neutrality, without even admitting that we are going to likely, or under we cannot exclude, and we'll come on to the test, the possibility that we will be harming it. So the answer to my Lord's question ultimately is no. Um, I can't say that because um, there is the ability, if, if there is harm, for the decision maker to then decide whether notwithstanding that harm, that's subject to those high hurdles, um, and then that would be uh, um, assessed for legal compliance. So that's what well, under the directive is Article 6.4. It's IROP, um, no reasonable alternatives, and compensation. So you'd have to uh, create compensating habitat, you'd have to be IROP, and you would um, have to um, 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 show that there are no re uh, alternatives. So, um, Are you going to introduce us to the 
methodology under the yes. Vice um, could I then come to the methodology at 4.7, my lord? Yeah. Um, and um, page eight. Yes, it's page eight. And paragraph 4.7, your lordship will see that um, for each input, Natural England accepts that there is a degree of uncertainty. We say this is relevant when we come back to the argument now being done. Well, it doesn't matter, you're not using best scientific, because there's precautionary elements built in. That's not how the guidance actually is set out. For each, and it gives a number of um, examples. There's um, uncertainty with predicting occupancy levels, with identifying current land, farm types, and associated nutrients. You see that again at para 4.7. At um, 4.8 as well, and it's quite imp we, we emphasize this, um, Natural England is always passing the buck, I want to say quite rightly, because the local authority is a competent authority, that it's up to the local authority to create the precautionary uh, approach. And then a reference is made uh, throughout, and then the final stage, um, which is 4.8, to the precautionary buffer. And we'll, we'll deal with the precautionary buffer more ground three. Right, just bef before we go anywhere else, um, we see what is written in paragraphs 4, 7 and 4, 8. Um, bearing in mind that you make certain criticisms of the advice, um, is there any criticism here of the content of those two paragraphs? on the basis that they do not represent what the law says? It's a very difficult question to ask because we think the whole procedure doesn't represent well, what the law... Please um, focus on these two paragraphs. Yes. They're important paragraphs. Um, yes. I apprehend. Yes. Uh, is there any specific criticism made of what these two paragraphs say? Yes. OK, if I'm going to cherry-pick out of something that's... In, is that each of them are based on uncertain assumptions which have, on the face of it, little or no um, uh, um, rational um, basis. So, um, it's asserted that they're based on best available scientific evidence and research, but then when we come to look at it, um, that's not, not the basis. Um, well, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you misreading that? Isn't it simply saying that the inputs, one of which is occupancy rate, um, should be based on the best available scientific evidence and research? And if that's what it said, is there anything wrong with that? Oh, sorry. If it says the nutrient capacity calculation um, uh, and must include key inputs and assumptions that are based on. I would, I would agree, but it, I don't read it as that. It says it's a statement of what they've done. The nutrient calculation includes key inputs, assumptions that are based on best, and we don't, I, I don't accept that as my ground one. What do you not accept exactly? That the nutrient calculation includes key inputs and assumptions that are based on the best available scientific evidence and research. That's ground one, for example. Well, is it ground one? Um, we just look at ground one as as you pleaded it. Page sixteen in the core bundle. That that's directed at Judge's conclusion concerning what the LPA did think in selecting and using the 2.4 national average occupancy rate in the appropriate assessment. Um, once the judge concluded, as he did, that the use of the national average occupancy rate was not the best available scientific evidence, it was not open to him to that it was nevertheless sufficiently precautionary. 
And that doesn't seem to be a criticism directly of paragraph 47 or 48 of the Price Act. It's, it's a criticism implicitly of what the LPA actually did in That's my judicial review. I'm not judicial. Yes, I'm judicially reviewing a decision by Farron yeah. and appealing the decision well, of Mr. Justice asking, That's why we are both asking you this question. Yeah. So I'm not answering challenge. it, but it's not the basis of the appeal. I mean, I can't appeal. I've got to appeal the judgment, and I, and also the decision which I'm challenging. Well, self-evidently, Mr. Jones, yeah. but we, we're seeking to understand what you are in fact submitting <coughs> with your help. Well, I'm trying to be self. Um, I mean, just occup- to just to lay out some of the possibilities. One thing you might say is that the um, Natural England advice was hopelessly flawed and didn't. Um, comply with the directive. Another, another thing you might say is that the advice was perfectly good, but the council didn't apply it properly, um, which is a very different case. And um, some of the <coughs> paragraphs in the officer's report that we looked at yeah. might give you some basis for making that argument. Yes. Uh, and before uh, the High Court, we said both. We, we criticised the advice, and we also criticised the officer's at this point, I'm going to do something that might seem unconventional. I'm going to ask you to articulate the submissions um, just before we go any further so that we've got clearly in sight what the, what the argument actually is. So, at, as it were, at dictation speed, please, would you tell us what the submission is right. well, in this part of your case? So I haven't moved on to my grounds, so I don't understand your Lordship's question, first of all. What, what are you asking me? Are you asking me to articulate, well, articulate my grounds? We, we're looking Or at answer a question that my Lord... I don't want to be difficult. No, well, but, I'm um, sure you don't, Mr. Jones. No, I don't. Um, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but I we're trying... I'm sure we do, uh, None of us are trying to be... But I do, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be honest. I don't understand what your Lordship is asking me. I'm asking you to articulate your submission when it goes to paragraphs 4, 7 and 4, 8 of the advice note. Are you, are you arguing here or not that the content of those two paragraphs is legally flawed? Or are you arguing something different? Right. I, so for the first point, Miller, sorry, I now understand. So first sentence, my Lord, I, I do say it's legally flawed because we don't accept that the first sentence is a, is, is a correct characterization of what the guidance represents. So the, the, the first sentence says the neutrality calculation includes key inputs and assumptions that are based on the best scientific evidence and research. So that is... That is a matter we take issue with. Right, so you submit that the first sentence of paragraph 47 is legally flawed. Uh, that must follow from ground one, my lord. I think that's right. Right. Um, I'm not, um, it's been developed as a pragmatic tool. Um, I'm not, not sure about. Um, the legality of that, um, other than pragmatism mustn't be used as an excuse when we come on to look at the um, legal requirements as an excuse to say something is too difficult or isn't, isn't cost effective. Um, but um, I'm not saying we should... Um... And then the next one is, however, for each input there's a degree of uncertainty. We agree with that. And we agree with um, the examples that are given. So the, the legal flaw in paragraph 47 lies in the first sentence alone. Uh, certainly in terms of gra- ground one, uh, uh, one, yes. And then insofar as pragmatic tool, I mean... Well, you didn't criticise that just now. Uh, what I said was it shouldn't be used as a reason to depart from the legal 
legal requirements. So no, no, but what we're doing at the moment um, is looking at the content of the advice note itself. Yes. So if it's, if it's a pragmatic tool that, 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 that meets the legal requirements, I have no criticism. But if the were use of the word pragmatism, as we see later on, is used as a reason for not um, relying on the best scientific evidence, then if it's used in that cir circumstance, then I would have a legal issue with it. Paragraph 4.8. Um, have no problem, um, and we've indeed emphasised it with the first sentence, it is up to the planning authorities to take the precautionary approach. And um, in line with legislation and case law, and addressing uncertainty and calculating nitrogen budgets, we endorse, endorse that. We endorse the general in the next <coughs> point of um, uh, uh, um, precautionary rates to variables, but um, obviously we have an issue with the buffer is in our grounds, so um, we don't um, um, accept that the, um, the operation that's background three. Well, are, are you? Arg I'm sorry. The question is: are, are you arguing that that part of paragraph four eight is legally flawed? Yeah, yes, because it re well it relates to a particular pr pr precautionary buffer. Right. So the third par third sentence of paragraph four eight is legally flawed. Yes. Is your point there that the principle of a buffer is correct, but the 20% figure which appears later is not properly scientifically evidenced. Or if you can have something more yes. than that. If you could have a, and this is not this case, but if you have a buffer that is calculated on the basis of um, best scientific evidence to justify what it's a buffer to. So um, first of all, you've got to have an appraisal of what is the variance. So when you're um, looking at assumptions, uh, seem to um, be accused of being beating people's case, but you have an assumption, you need to you need to establish what the variance of the assumption are, by the way. And have a, a best scientific um, view as to what the variance are of the uncertainty. And then if you're going to apply a buffer you then you need to know whether that buffer is sufficient to deal with the range of uncertainty which you have assessed there to be. Otherwise, it's just guessing. As, so as, so as, is, is the answer to my question yes? Yes. If it's it, yes. But, but uh, the reason why I'm saying no in this case is because it's reference to a specific buffer. This is part of the advice. I've been asked to take two paragraphs and go through them and to analyse them, but we're always supposed to look at documents as a whole. And this reference, my Lord President, is to a particular buffer, which is a buffer that they're applying. So, for example, um, one can't, as, as um, my Lord, Lord, um, Lord uh, Mr Justice Jay said, you know, the buffer in his judgment. Why is it not 10%? Why is it not 20%? Why is it 30%? Um, it, 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 if it's to be a buffer, it has to be a buffer. You know how to have the parameters. A buffer at a railway station has capacity as to what, what it will be able to stop a speeding train coming into Charing Cross when the, the brakes have gone. You know, it isn't calculated. If you were travelling in, Charing Cross and told, well, don't worry if the brakes go, we've got a buffer. And you say, well, what's the count? Well, I don't know, but we've chosen 20%. I think the last thing I'd do would be ask them for their calculation. Of no, well, <laughs> there we are, yeah. But um, that's our point. But in terms of, in isolation, a precautionary buffer, um, in isolation, my Lord, President, um, no, we don't take issue if it's a correct precautionary buffer, and that's our ground three. Um, obviously, the last 
line of recording approach to the um, helps local authorities and applicants to demonstrate certain certainty uh, for the needs of those. All I would say is, in terms of that, since I'm asking, that, it's not a question of helps, it's a requirement. But, I mean... Well, well, the question, I suppose, might be, does a precautionary approach to the calculations and solutions help the LPA and applicants to demonstrate the certainty needed for their assessments, which is what it says? Yes. It does. But so, it's, it's, so, it, so that's correct. The fourth sentence is correct. The final sentence. Yes, in, in terms so, of that. So the yes. criticisms, um, as I understand it, then from what you've submitted just now, the criticisms of these two paragraphs are, are essentially and particularly directed at the first sentence of paragraph four point seven and the third. Sorry, the it's actually the second, isn't it? The second sentence of paragraph four eight. Now, well, Lord. You've asked me about those two paragraphs. Do you lordship on our submissions on 4.6 and 4.9 as well? Because it's under the, the whole approach to calculation. If you're submitting that there are other legal flaws in this part of the advice note, I think we need to know now what they are. Yeah. Can I, can I address those when I address my graphs? By all means. By, yeah. If you'd rather do it in that part of your submissions. But we are going to need to understand what your case is, you see. No, I just wondered whether it might be a good idea to well, gain that yes, understanding of course, if you can't. Yeah. So, I mean, if your lordships don't understand my case, then I've got a problem. Because <laughs> if you don't understand the case, I can't. Um, um, so, I will do my best. Um, So um, could I then just, whilst um, could we just uh, maybe then um, look at um, the approach then at um, 4. Point, can I ask your Lordship just to go on to 4.18.19, the actual methodology? Um, and... Um, <clears throat> Section, if you take stage one, you um, calculate um, the total nitrogen which will be deposited per annum from the proposed development that would then exit the wastewater treatment works. And so, stage step one involves calculating the additional um, population, um, both new housing and overnight. And, um, and that's 4.18, 4.19. Um, and then, and that's made by reference to the national average occupancy. That's our round one. And the remaining steps of the first stage. Uh, just forgive me, what it says in the pre penultimate line of 4.18 is should consider using yes. the average national occupancy rate of 2. Yes. Uh, what, is it... and, and on your submission, is there anything wrong? with Natural England giving advice to local planning authorities that they should consider doing this? No, that's, as we'll see, the advice makes it this is a starting point. So I think the answer to my question is yes. no. Yes, I did say yes. But it's, no, it's no, there's nothing wrong with that. No, no not of itself. Right, thank you very much. A... And then at 4.19, it says, however, competent authorities may choose to adopt bespoke calculations tailored to the area or scheme rather than using national population or occupancy assumptions. Again, is there anything wrong on your submission with that advice that they may choose to adopt bespoke calculations? In terms of um, no, um, save that, which we'll come on to see, um, the, ad the, the advice, uh, in, if in so far as it implies a sort of general public law discretion that you can just stick with the national housing, and it would be wrong, but when you actually look at the, the advice, it says it's a starting point. So I don't don't um, take issue. Of course, that you've got to. Uh, I, I say it's not just may shall. They, they they have to look. That's the only issue I suppose I would have. Okay. But it's 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 put in unless this is partly what's led to where we are. 
but I, um, I'm certainly not saying you, you, you can't start with looking at national housing. I have to say, if that's the be-all and end-all, my, my, my Lord, then I, I, I would have difficulties in agreeing that there's nothing wrong with that if that was to be the, the be-all and end-all of the device. It's, it's, it's almost impossible, I would submit, to imagine where a national occupancy rate could, unless it by some chance hit on the particular area and the particular houses worked, um, would be the place. So I do say yes, but qualified, I cannot foresee many examples where that advice would, the first bit of the advice, which, which asked, answered my, my Lord's answer, would be correct of itself. And in respect of the second, yes, of course, I would say, you've got to look at those as part of my case. But just saying may, in my submission, my, um, invites the errors of law that we see the local authority making. I, I would submit to your lordship, it, it, it must be that they must. Um, it is very difficult to see that a national occupancy rate could ever be best scientific evidence. So, um, as I say, whilst, um, so it's a very qualified yes to the first question because, in fact, I can imagine theoretically a hypothetical situation where that would amount to best scientific evidence, but, in fact, you're going to be starting there and going immediately in our submission to a requirement and not a may that you've got to look for um, best scientific evidence, which is, is going to be um, not national house sizes, averages, and not um, uh, national occupancy. Um, stage two, the other, the other um, stages aren't relevant to the claim 420 to 4, 4, 444. Stage two calls for working out the existing nitrogen level, which requires the land to be assigned a certain type. Um, and that's an average. And then an average is then applied to the... Um, to the nitrogen um, loss from that farm type using farm scoper, and that for your Lordship's reference is 4.45 to That's that's ground that's ground two. Well, you say that's ground two. Just so I can be clear. Yeah. Uh, is there anything in the text of paragraphs four point forty five to four point fifty seven, which you criticise as being wrong in law, or, or is is your argument going to be in due course that it was the application which was wrong in law and not the actual advice? If there is something that you criticise as being yes. wrong in law, it would be helpful if we could see it. Now. Yes. Well, as as um, one example is the use of the farm scoper model, which um, is relied on um, um, there, we, and um, and at Appendix One at um, pages 48 to 49, and um, we'll come on to it later, but the farm scope and methodology doesn't meet the requirements because it uses, well, it uses a, um, its approach to um, total nitrogen, which with, um, is, 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 critter, um, is, is, is accepted not to be of itself sufficiently precautionary, but reliance is then placed on other uh, assumptions. But I probably, my lord, could I just take you very quickly now, coming on to this ground two, supplementary bundle 146, um, which has um, a Dr. O'Neill's um, criticism. Well, please don't take your submissions out of turn. I just wanted, since we were on the text, I just wanted yes, to identify no, what, if anything, in the text you criticise. That's all. Yes. So the use of the farm scoper, 
Um, the same exercise as we attempted with paragraphs 4, 7, and 4, 8. Yes. Let me just get that. So, um, the, 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 the issues, which is so 4.45, it's the approach first to um, the next stage is to calculate the existing nitrogen losses from the current land uses within the red line boundary of the scheme. So, the um, nitrogen loss from the current land will be removed and replaced from the proposed development land. That's the net. So, that that process is, 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 is um, um, as assessed at 4.6 using farm scoper, which uses um, averages for different farm types across the catchment, as you can see, to the drain of the solar. So we take um, issue with that. We take, as, as a lawful approach, we also take issue with the um, proposed uh, that, that effectively what happens then is that a a development 4.47 covers agricultural land that clearly falls within a, fer, a particular farm type then you would use the farm scope model then a modelled average nitrate nitrogen loss from the farm should be used Again, that is using um, another average nitrogen, nitrogen loss from the farm, which we say is the wrong approach. We also um, uh, take issue because um, the approach um, four point four four um, uh, uh, four two. So um, take issue with the. Um, the approach is to averaging out uh, or, or, of um, nitrate um, levels, and I'll come on to that in ground two. So that's that's a set of, uh, effectively the assumptions made from um, 4.45 to um, 4.50. Then 4.52, there's greenfield land that's not in agricultural use and have not been used for the last 10 years. In these areas, there's no agricultural input into the baseline these car um, and so therefore um, they um, into the landline base niching value of five kilograms per hectare should be used so what you've got is we say a flawed approach because not only are you making average assumption so I come along and say I've got to, I want to build some houses on it you say well um, we make assumptions of the type of um, farming that may be on this land uh, there's no there's no assessment as to what is actually happening on the land its relationship and its distance to the protected area I'll come on to that in the case law to demonstrate that that is something that you need to do which the court will supervise it all so so my field which may be whatever distance from the solar nest and your field are treated the same in it, their use being the same then you get to 4.52, and there's no agriculture on the land at all. It hasn't been used for 10 years. So the previous slide includes sites that aren't currently used at the baseline time for agriculture, but have been used for the last 10 years, some period in the last 10 years for agriculture. They're given a figure for producing <coughs> nitrogates, nitrates. And then you get to 5.2. There's ones that haven't been used at all for 10 years. And they are assigned five kilograms per hectare. So they're not even producing and never have, on the face of it, any nitrates, but they're factored in to effectively um, a baseline nitrogen. So they're given credit. So you say that should be zero? Yeah, you, yeah it should be zero. What about sure. um, atmospheric deposition, pet waste, and the rest, which they say is what the five is based on? 
So there's 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 um, there's um, no evidence at all um, that there is um, that the site is any of these sites are producing five kilograms of of nitrates into the baseline, which is the baseline from which you then um, carry out all your calculations for housing. Um, there's an assumption made also, which my little president will know. It's almost like a, it's a it's a, what's known as a fallback position in planning, where if you've got planning permission or permitted development for something, and you come along for something else, instead of comparing the baseline to what is actually there, you demonstrate, and then it's a matter of planning judgment as to wait to give them and say, well, actually, if I don't get planning permission for 20 homes, I'm going to build the petrol filling station. I've got planning permission. That's my fallback. And, there's, and then this is entirely domestic law, and it's a matter for the decision maker to assess how likely it is and all of that, and what weight to give them, subject to Wensbury. But we're not in that territory. We're looking, supposedly, to have best scientific evidence as to a mathematical formula that will ensure that areas that are already failing will be, uh, development can be allowed, that will be, you can be assured will be neutral. So you're allowing um, um, sites that there's no evidence that they've actually produced any um, nitrogen discharge at all. You're giving them a quota, that's the ones that haven't had agriculture. Those that um, may have had agriculture in the 10 years or currently, um, those that may not have agriculture at the moment but have in the last 10 years, you're making an assumption that if they don't get planning permission for um, housing, they will revert to a they will uh, be used for a particular type of agriculture. So it's even stronger than a fallback position. That's completely the opposite, we submit, to a precautionary approach. Completely the opposite. So you're presuming things that haven't happened will happen to up the baseline. This is ground, ground two. I mean, um, why should a field that is in private ownership, that is not being used, have a figure for pet waste, for example? So, um, Just make three points and then I'll do, um, come to the law. Um, first point I've already made, we're in a failing situation. Second, we're in an area of uncertainty which is not acknowledged in the guidance. Um, and third, it's put forward as a way, not the only way, but as a way um, that um, our um, that development can proceed, but of course there there are other ways. You can actually improve your wastewater treatment plants. And um, as I've said, if this advice were to be found unlawful, its application it doesn't necessarily lead, and the reasons I also given to my lord or Justice Singh, to a moratorium on any development. But um, if we are going to do something, um, then this is not the answer. So we turn to the um, uh, legal framework. Um, part of it was set up by the learning judge at Paris 23 to 40. Um, I want to um, 
we deal within our skeletons uh, uh, argument at, at 23 tw uh, and 20, 22 and 23. But can I then just uh, take um, your lordships to uh, um, Article 6.3, which you find, your lordships find in the authorities um, um, bundle, which is um, at um, tab uh, 39. And um, there's no um, issue between the parties as to the transposition of Article 6.3, which the Lordships find um, at uh, page 1263 of the, the directive. And of course, the background, whilst the preambles uh, don't form part of the um, Brexit transferred legislation, your Lordship sees the background and purpose of the directive which was um, in the preambles and if I can just one two six one draw your Lordship's attention they're unnumbered um, un un unhelpfully but if your Lordships have one two six one left column the fifth paragraph whereas the preservation protection improvement are essential objective um, as stated in Article 130R of the Treaty, and um, 1261 on the right-hand column at the top, I think it's uh, paragraph 8, whereas in the European de uh, term member states, um, and this continues to be the case here, are continuing to deteriorate, increasing number of wild species seriously threatened, whereas uh, given the number of threatened species and form part of natural heritage and threats and we're often trans it's necessary to take measures in order to conserve them um, whilst I don't suggest that the binding that philosophy remains as a, a, a behind uh, the, the incorporation and the continued existence of the habitats directed and um, and um, then nine it refers to the threats to habitats and then whereas in order to ensure the restoration or maintenance of natural habitats at a favourable conser conservation status necessary to designate. So the reason of designation and um, which we have maintained is the notion of um, these, places, uh, these areas must be um, maintained in a favourable status and we must take steps to ensure that they're favourable. Of course, where we're looking at here Unless I've taken your lordship through any back, is um, unfavourable. Um, in terms of the case law, um, I, we don't believe there's any issue on the case law that your lordships need to be concerned about in terms of its um, validity post Brexit. But for your lordship's note, we dealt with it at paragraph. I don't ask your lordship to go to it. Paragraph 32 of our High Court skeleton argument. As I say, it hasn't been an issue, so we haven't. Uh, but you'll find it's Court Bundle 17192, Para 32. Um, the Habitats Regulations, of course, are tabbed. Um, uh, 29 of the authorities bundle and so in, in terms of really regulation 63 or 6 or 6 uh, 946 assessment of the implications and um, sorry I, I've got a bundle without page numbers oh, I'm so, um, so sure. if you could um, so help me to find it a bit more slowly I'd be grateful I'm sorry um, tab 29 my lord 
Yes. Um, begins with the um, 2017 Conservation Habitat Species Regulations. Did photocopy both sides. Yes. And then if one turns over, there should be um, Regulation 63 um, on page. So assessment of implications, that one? Correct, my lord, yes. yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. So this is, um, well, iron ironically uh, transposing Article 63 by Regulation 63, but that's in coincidence. Um, so the 631 is commonly referred to the screening stage, which is a word taken actually from an environmental impact assessment. It's not actually you. Um, and so you ask whether the project is likely to have a significant effect. And then it needs then to be screened into the appropriate assessment. This one was screened in. Um, and um, one of the issues, um, references made to the case of Smith in this court, Court of Appeal, uh, I was unsuccessful there on a number of issues, one of which was um, that um, you should not take into account mitigation at the screening stage, because that was contrary to an advocate general's opinion and the Commission's guidance. So I lost on that in front of Court of Appeal Law Justice Sales, and no reference was given. That uh, decision was, um, uh, uh, is now no longer good law on that point after people over wind that we will look at, where the European Court of Justice, without an advocate general, um, found that, um, that the approach um, of um, including um, mitigation in the screening stage was flawed. So you, um, you, but here we are into an appropriate assessment. So again, as part of the context, we're in the, a position where um, unless um, the application of the um, guidance ensures um, no harm, um, there will be likely to be significant environmental effects, and um, we cannot then um, discount, which six appropriate assessment um, then says, at six, uh, regulation 63.5. Just before we get there, Mr. Jones, um, Smith remains good law on all other aspects of the decision, does it? Well, the, the point uh, about whether Wensbury is the right test, I think the Supreme Court and others have um, confirmed that Wensbury is the test. I am not seeking to argue there's a different test. My argument is, in this case, that Wensbury, as it always is, is applied within the statutory, com uh, the statutory um, requirements which Parliament has set. Yeah. So Parliament is set by the regulations and by the kind of case yeah, but my lord, that's right. Clear. The, the question was, is Smith otherwise still good law, apart from the point on mitigation, which um, has now been dealt with by people over wind? Smith is otherwise still good law, is the question. I need to look at the other grounds, but it's certainly good law for the point that was, that's been raised by uh, um, Mr. M Mr. Mull, whether it's applied rightly by Mr. Mull to this case, that um, there isn't uh, another another test. Right, thank you. There were a number of other grounds, so I can't handle on heart say whether they're all still. But they don't arise in this case. So, um, Regulation 65, uh, 63.5. And this is this is this is where there is a change to what you know what would otherwise be a normal planning judgment um, under the Town and Country Planning Act, Regulation Five. In the light of the conclusions of the assessment, which is under EU law called an appropriate assessment, we tend to call it HRA um, Habitats Regulations Assessment, subject to Regulation um, uh, uh, Sixty Four and Sixty Four is. Is, is Article 6.4 transpose, which I addressed my Lord Lord Justice Singh on, IROPI, overriding public interest. But subject to that, the competent authority may agree to the plan or project 
only after Hassett ascertain that it will not adversely affect the integrity of the European side or the European offshore marine side, as the case may be. So, um, um, where uh, five comes in, it's not a case that you would otherwise, under the, if we take it in English planning circumstances, you could make a judgment that there was adverse effect to the integrity of an SBA. But you say, well, the housing need or the need for new hospitals is so great, as a matter of planning judgment, we, are, we outweigh it. You can't do that. What you have to would do if you wanted to grant consent, having found that, is go to 64, which then um, um, sets out um, a procedure um, which um, I've, I, I, I've summarised where you have to show that there is um, imperative reasons. Yeah, and, and no one is relying on 64. No one's relying on it. We're so, not in so, this. So, so we note it and we can pass on. Um, and um, we so just, as we pass on, could we just, however, um, remind ourselves of what Lord Justice Sales said in Smith? Um, at uh, paragraph 78, this is tab 10 in the authorities bundle. Paragraph 78 of Lord Justice Sales, as he then was his judgment. Um, he, he starts by saying, the further issue arising from Mr. Jones's submissions concerns the standard of review by a national court supervising the compliance by a relevant competent authority of the legal requirements of Article 63 of the Directive. Although the legal test under each limb of Article 63 is a demanding one, requiring a strict precautionary approach to be followed, it also clearly requires evaluative judgments to be made, having regard to many varied factors and considerations, which he then amplifies by reference to authority. Um, that reference to evaluative judgments remains good law, does it? You, you, um, yes, you're looking at evaluative judgments. Yes. Um, I, I will take take your. So I'm not. I, I'm not saying that. Um, um, that um, we um, apply. Um, I've already said what I'm saying. I'll say it again. Playing Wensbury in the context of what is required under the precautionary principle and what's required under um, the Habitats regulations as interpreted by case law of um, European Court of Justice, which is yeah. um, carried through and, and, and binding. So I don't, I don't um, um, accept that uh, this passage is an answer the submissions I've yet <coughs> to make, but I will, you know, we, we no, may, we we'll may. We're looking at the law, Mr. Jones. Um, yes. And when, we're, when we listen to your submissions on Regulation 63.5, yes. um, do we need to understand or not that um, the business of ascertainment, which is the verb used actually in yes. 63.5, embraces evaluative judgment? Yes. But that evaluative judgment must meet standards required by the law and this court approach uh, because of those regulations in order to satisfy the Wensbury test may, may well be different to those that it would have for example in an ordinary planning case. Well you'll show us authority for that proposition I'm sure. I am. I, I hope I already have in the skeletons but would we'll take your lordship to see what the European Court of Justice Will requires specifically of the court. Yeah. Yes. So um, your lordship took, took us to um, S um, Smith, which um, obviously we'll come to. Um, so um, 
need to look at the um, um, a deal now with um, the case law before the lunch, Chairman, I hope. Um, so, um, if we go to um, tab 33, Sweetman on board Planola. Do you wish us to put away the regulations now or keep them open? It's a matter for your Lordship if you find it useful. I, I, um, You're going to be coming back to them, I think, aren't you? In due, in due course. I'm going to the case law now, my Lord, so uh, you well, can... as a precaution, I'll take them out of the So if we go tab 33, um, para 44, page 1055, take your lordship to um, lordships to some passage we will be relying on in our grounds. Um, an appropriate assessment cannot have lacuna must be complete, precise, definitive findings and conclusions capable of removing all reasonable scientific doubt as the effects of the works proposed on the protected site. That's a para 40, 45. So in the, in the court's judgment? Yes. Yes, my lord. <clears throat> And so, uh, my lord, it's a bit slightly um, uh, uh, Hulahan against on board Planola. Um, tab 36. Sorry, yes, your lordship. I do apologise. Page one oh six six at the top left of the um, para. Th it's para. Paragraph thirty seven. Paragraph thirty six. And it's one oh six five. It's one oh six five to one oh six six of the ten sixty six at the top. Paragraph 37, you want. My lord, yes. Yes. So, all aspects which might affect those objectives must be identified. And then the assessment must contain, again, complete, precise, definitive findings in that regard. Um, a failure in that assessment to identify the entirety of the habitat of the species, mm -hmm. which, um, as observed, uh, would not be su sufficient. So that's an example where um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hole. We rely on the principles that are applied throughout, and we see this as a common thing. Complete, precise, definitive. Um, could we go to Vodensey, going back a little bit in time, tab 32. Um, yeah. And um, this may be easier. So the paragraph fifty-eight of the judgment, which um, I'm sorry, to find. I was just going to uh, thirty-two. Yes, thirty-two. Thank you. Fifty-two. Paragraph fifty-two of the judgment. Um, no. Um, par paragraph. Um, 58, please, my lord. This is 728. Yeah. Clear the authorization criteria at 63, which is regulation 63, integrates a precautionary principle 
makes it possible effectively to prevent adverse effects on the integrity of protected sites. Projects being considered a less stringent authorization criteria than one in question could not as effectively ensure fulfillment of the objectives of the site tended under that provision. Well, does that tell us anything more than the text of the provision itself? It, 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 I, it, it we refer to it only in, in, in that it, it, it's, it's, effect, it's essential to um, fulfilling the objective and, and its relationship with the precautionary principle. But, um, and then um, could I just um, deal with Vodensey at paragraph um, 57, um, my lord, um, where doubt remains as to absence of adverse effects on the integrity of the site linked to the plan or the, co the competent authority will have to refuse the authorization and in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Singh's point just a moment ago that's effectively saying what article 6.3 and regulation 6.3 says the Dutch, could I then take your Lordship then, I think it's um Pretty much the last authority I want to take your lordships to, but it's um, we might get back to Fonzie briefly. But the, as I said, the Dutch ni uh, nitrogens case, um, which your lordships um, sh should have a tab 37. And um, This, um, it begins um, page 581. This was dealing with um, an authorization scheme in the Netherlands um, known as the PAS, introduced for agricultural activities. And I'm, you'll see from the head, which caused nitrogen de depositions in sites protected by the habitats directive. And the PAS aimed to conserve and where necessary restore Nutura 2000 sites um, and then it describes um, what was included in the PAS I'm not going to read that out but your lordships will have the background um, set out in the um, in the head note there because obviously this is where, where, where I'm transposing seeing in the contact something that exists in Dutch law uh, how this um, then 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 was treated and and how what the court um, said. So can I just start with the advocate general whose opinion was followed, and then I'll move to the judgment and just highlight some passages, um, which means hopefully I won't go back to them and won't dealing with the grounds. But your lordships will have them both for grounds one and two. So here, I mean, one of the. One of the reasons why we do suggest this is particularly relevant because, I mean, it's not the same thing, obviously, but we are dealing with nitrogen, a similar, we're dealing with a similar sort of problem that the, the Natural England um, guidance is um, seeking to deal with in as much as the consequences of uh, nitrogen deposition um, from, well, this is from agricultural activity. Um, um, and on uh, protected areas, and the what the what the Europe first the Advocate General and the European Court of Justice says is required under the legal um, principles. So the relevant factors in the assessment. So we have the word pragmatic, of course. Advocate Generals, which was picked up um, in the uh, naturally uh, Advocate General forty nine. There was a, a criteria imposed on a, oh no, sorry, pro, programmatic, sorry, not pragmatic, assessment that considered in particular reasonable scientific doubt as the findings. So um, AG50, um, we, we, we um, draw to your, uh, the Lord uh, Court's attention. First of all, it must be accurately determined how much nitrogen is released by individual projects to be coordinated and what proportion of it reaches the nitrogen sensitive habitats in each of the protective sites. So just pausing there, it's not just saying site X produces X amount of nitrogen. It's 
and it's a point that um, Dr. O'Neill picked up. It's it's what proportion of it reaches each of the protected sites. AG 51, it's necessary to determine for any land in protected uh, sites on which protected habitats are located, the maximum amount of nitrogen deposited by the individual project under examination. The necessary degree of refinement of the spatial framework for analysis, that is to say, what tracts of land must be assessed individually, depends on how much deposition may vary from one tract to the next. Then AG 52, at the same time, the total nitrogen load that land from existing activities must be accurately determined. So you've got to accurately determine what is already on the site in question and also having regard, as I said, at AG50, as to what proportion of it reaches the nitrogen sensitive sites. It's not sufficient, therefore, to limit the examination to certain sectors, such as agriculture. Said all nitrogen sources, such as transport, industry, private housing, must take into account. Then there's other factors. AG54, um, we haven't managed to get hold of the Danish submissions and, and, and um, how they were expressed, but it's recorded they rightly made at the hearing it's possible to rely on estimates. An appropriate assessment of the implications for the site is necessarily a forecast of future effects of activities in question. And obviously we've got to understand, particularly in European cases, what these things mean. But when we get, we get that from the AG at 55. Such estimates must nonetheless be consistent with the sensitivity of the habitat species concerned and the actual risk of adverse effects from the deposition of nitrogen. It's partly why I've emphasised before um, the position that we face in the Solent. It would not be sufficient merely to show rough averages and to ignore local or temporary peak values and those of peak values are likely to affect the conservation objectives of the site. The Advocate General then go, goes on, and can I take your Lord um, to AG um, 94 when it deals with future development? Because <clears throat> uh, it, it points out, that, uh, the Advocate General points out AG 92, a common feature of all the measures that are not related to projects that have been discussed so far is the fact that their effects have not yet been established, but they're only expected only in the future. I'm sorry, which paragraph? I'm sorry, my, my Lord, it's AG 92, which is 602 in the top left. And so um, a, um, AG 82 introduces the issue is dealing with future, future projects. Um, and it, it deals with the argument that sort of the average, well, there may be future room in the future, things may be less. And AG 93 must therefore be clarified whether it's possible to authorise projects on the assumption that source directing measures, measures which are implemented under pass and decreasing for other reasons, will in future create additional nitrogen room deposits. So in other words, you can create extra, even though this has yet been established with certainty. However, and this is the point, this is the paragraph we would respectfully, um, Mr. President, our, 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 um, our I'll ask your lordships to um, emphasise. However, it's the date of the decision authorising implementation of the project. There must be no reasonable scientific doubt remaining as to the absence of adverse effects on the integrity of the site in question. The obstacle is naturally very difficult to overcome in the case of future measures and development, both as regards the effectiveness of the measures and in terms of the sanctity of the measures will actually occur. So the reason when we then go... Um, to the Advocate General's opinion a little bit further on. Um, AG 147 is, a, is, is a page 610 um, and um, deals with, um, we'll come on to it in um, looking at the court judgment, but AD 1. AG 146610, a mere average value um, uh, cannot guarantee there are no significant effects on any single project as a result of fertilising or grazing on the basis of specific conditions, in particular interaction with other nitrogen sources. Consequently, this overall assessment does not of itself permit fertilising grazing to be exempted from the individual appropriate assessment of the implications for the site. 
that was looking at um, whether you can make these block assumptions based on averages uh, to see that there were no harm. But the principle applies, we say, precisely to the present case. You've got sites where, in the methodology, um, rough assumptions are made, both as to um, what the land, uh, well, um, land will be used for in in, in the future, um, um, and then assigning it to it values, some of which are values for land that, as a matter of fact, hasn't hasn't been in in in, in agricultural use at all. But even those that have um, are not um, uh, do not meet um, what the advocate general there says is necessary in order to. Um, satisfy the precautionary principles and the requirements of the directive. Moving to the judgment, my lord. Um, page 635, paragraph 100, a uh, matter that, um, uh, and, and 99 and 100 we've dealt with. Uh, 101, in order to ensure that all requirements thus recorded are fulfilled, so these are the ones we've already looked at. It is for the national courts to carry out a thorough and in-depth examination of the scientific soundness of the appropriate um, assessment within the meaning of 6.3 of the Habitats Directive, accompanying, in this case, a programmatic approach and the various arrangements for implementing it, including inter alia the use of software, such as that used in the main proceedings in, intended to contribute to the authorization process. So pausing there, my Lord, in, my, in answer to my Lord, um, Lord President's uh, question, uh, question, in essence, this is what I submit to your Lordship, um, is the statutory duty, as interpreted by binding case law, of um, the uh, Habitats regulations. And it is for national courts to go through a thorough, in-depth examination of the soundness within, and it said it's Article 6.3, Regulation 63 of the arrangements for implementing it. And there, there's an example, even the software there was an um, issue. The competent national authorities may be entitled to authorise such an individual project on the basis of such assessment only if the national court is satisfied the assessment carried out in advance meets those requirements respect of each specific individual project. So it's, it's not any confusion that in other jurisdictions it's the National Court that's the competent authority. Here in the Netherlands there's a distinction between um, similar planning authority, or consenting authority, and, 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 and um, the role of the courts. That doesn't sound like Wednesday to mm. me. Hmm? That does not sound like Wednesday to me. No, but it's a statutory requirement it, um, that's brought... Um, that is brought in by the correct interpretation of uh, Regulation 6, uh, uh, 63, which we know incorporates the precautionary principle, all of those requirements. That's why, although I didn't read it out, if your Lordship sees 99 and 100 before, those are essentially summarising the two aspects that we looked at before in terms of um, Regulation um, um, uh, 63. So, um, the way it could be reconciled with the Wednesday Spree is that the court, the national court, must still perform its usual supervisory jurisdiction. So it's not the national court itself which has to be satisfied, for example, about the scientific evidence. It has to be satisfied that the local planning authority could reasonably reach the appropriate assessment which it did on the basis of the scientific evidence it had before it. Well, the test, I, I, if one is trying, if one looks at the last sentence, competent national authority may be entitled to authorise that on the basis of the assessment, only if the national court is satisfied that the assessment carried out meets those requirements. Exactly. The, the, so, the heavy lifting in that sentence may be done by the word assessment. So what you're evaluating, the legality of, is the assessment by the local planning authority, not performing the assessment yourself. No, um, but if, it, if that be the case, the, the, the heavy lift, 
the court in supervising can't take a standoff approach in the way that it would normally do absent. Why not? Why, um, why isn't that witness proof? Because, uh, well, that is what, well, no, not a stand, because you're, the test is that you've got to have the best scientific. Yeah, and they think they do. The, 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 that's the standard they have to meet. Mm. It's not the court substituting its own opinion for theirs. But it would only be uh, Wednesbury. Uh, yeah. Now the question is, uh, the, the, and this is the, the difference. So even though the court uh, may be sitting as supervisory, it has to satisfy itself that a thorough and in-depth in examination the soundness has been carried out. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that, which is classic Wednesbury, if I may say so. In other um, words, what, what, what's going on here is that a public authority has to form an assessment. And as my Lord observed earlier by reference to Smith, paragraph 78, that includes an evaluative judgment by the local planning authority, not by the court, by them. Then the court supervises that evaluative judgment yeah. in the traditional Wednesbury way asking, for example, did the approach which they took in making that evaluative judgment uh, err in law, for example, because they failed to take into account a relevant consideration, or was the ultimate conclusion they reached, having formed that evaluative judgment, one which that they could not reasonably reach? Would you disagree with any of that formulation? I don't disagree that that's how the court normally approaches, uh, for example, planning. Uh, uh, but in planning. this context, yeah, but in, is that in, wrong? Well, the the only point, uh, the submission that I make, uh, my lord, is it, if you take the normal planning context where um, there is, um, and we'll come on to it on ground four, which we say is wrong, um, benign, heavily benevolent um, construction. That, for example, in my submission, is not consistent with a precautionary principle. Right. So, but it would be consistent with normal approaches, and so yes, I see. that's 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 my 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 point is yes, you could apply, uh, I've got to, you know I'm I'm not in a position to say Wednesbury is the uh, uh, application, but it's how you apply it as the court does in fact apply Wednesbury within different statutory contexts oh, in a yes. different way. Yes, absolutely. And, and so we're saying in this statutory context, you don't, one can't step back and see and just say, well, I can't, as a court, say anything about occupancy numbers or anything like that, because we, uh, you know, that appears in um, naturally when it plainly um, is in a position where it cannot be said to be authority to satisfy the precautionary principle. So that's really, uh, the point, the principles of construction that we find, particularly in planning law, normal domestic planning law, where it's hands off, it's matters of planning judgment, it's not to be read as a schoolmaster. He may have said black, but probably he meant white, etc., etc. Et we all, you know, all know those. Um, that is incompatible with the statutory scheme we've adopted. So, in short, either we mean what we say and we carry it out in applying Wednesday. Or are we saying that these requirements are just lip service? That uh, we're back to, um, we might, there is no difference to looking at a habitat case to looking at a normal planning uh, case where these strictures are not engaged. Uh, fundamentally, we say there is. And that's why, yes, you can, you can apply Wednesbury, but it's applying Wednesbury um, not in the, I've, seen, I've used standoff approach, mm. but applying all the principles we're familiar with in planning. They're not to be read, the President, Lord, Lord Justice Limblom has set them out in Mansell and elsewhere. We don't read it as, as a schoolmaster, we give benign. And I, that, that's perfectly legitimate in domestic planning, but it's inconsistent. It's, and I'm sorry, I'm not suggesting, my Lord, Mansell, it wasn't dealing with habitats, but if you were to apply it to the approach to habitats, um, in our submission and in applying Wednesbury, that would be um, contrary, we say, to the legal requirements that have been transposed 
and carried post Brexit through in the habitats regulations. I, I hope that's to answer Thank you, George. George's question. Um, right, we're going to stop now, Mr. Jones, and come yeah. back at five past two. Thank you, Lord. Court rise.